Hello, everyone. Welcome back to Geek Warning. I'm James Huang. Dave Rome has the week off this week. However, we have with us Kaylee Fretz. Kaylee, how are you? I am excellent. Hanging out over here. Doing some solo dadding this week. Doing some solo dadding. Mm -hmm. It's, uh... Just makes life interesting, you know. I thought it was, I thought it was too easy before, uh, just my life, and so thought we'd just add, spice it up a little bit by sending my wife away for a week. Mm, indeed, indeed. Uh -huh. Yeah. Also joining us is Ronan McLaughlin, who's just putting his kid to bed. Mm -hmm. And Kaylee, if you want any more challenges, like I can, <laughs> we, we can arrange an extra one there for you if you like. Just for, I mean, even, I was going to say a week, but even just a day or two would be. You know. <laughs> I think I'm all right. I think I'm all right. I think one is plenty. <laughs> they, they, would have, yep. they would basically look after each other. Like it would be no extra work for you. And like, yeah. Wow. That's what people keep telling us about having a second one is that, you know, they just start, they start entertaining each other. And I don't believe it. I think two is twice as many as one and three uh, times the work. <laughs> and, and correct. Somebody, a lot of people have warned me because we have another one in the way that apparently one is like having a pet and two is like owning a zoo. So, <laughs> so uh two times one yeah it doesn't it, for some reason it doesn't work out that way well welcome to dad warning everybody yeah indeed uh, indeed well this, <laughs> this this is what happens when the whole crew starts to get older right mm -hmm. uh anyway we have a wonderful show for you as always uh we've got some rumors of a new specialized tarmac sl8 that have been kicking around uh we've got a little bit of discussion on some updated etrto guidelines on recommended tire sizes for particular rim widths we have a test bike that tried to kill me we have uh kind of a bunch of random intros from muck off which is interesting uh, and then we also have Mavic possibly coming back onto the scene, although not in the way that you maybe would have expected. Hmm. And then we'll go ahead and talk about what's on our minds and maybe have a little PSA today. Uh, but before we get going on all that, I just want to remind everyone that here at Escape Collective, this is a member-funded publication. And Geek Warning especially is a member-funded podcast. So if you have not already signed up to be a member of, of Escape Collective, please go ahead and do so because, well... Let's just go ahead and be blunt. This is how we all make our livings now. So please help us. <laughs> Otherwise, we won't exist. I mean, and as, as I've said before, we will still exist. Just this whole podcast publication thing will not exist. We will still be alive. I, I will actually dissolve. Oh. Yeah. Into a puddle of sadness. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Uh, please sign up. Please I, I'm sign not, up. <laughs> I'm not sure how I should respond to that, so I'm not going to. Uh, let, hey, hey, Ronan, would, would, maybe we should start with this. Uh, some rumors that we've been hearing about this potential specialized Tarmac SL8. Huh? What are, what are we hearing here? Uh, we're not actually hearing a whole lot. Uh, we just we spotted, like I'm sure many will have, on the Weight Winnies forum, which is, of course, one of the. Uh, well, let's say the second best website on the on the internet, will we? Um, someone had posted a picture of a box, which presumably is in a specialized dealership in Melbourne, judging by the sort of shipping label on this box. And the code for what's presumably inside the box is Tarmac SL8 SW frame set. Um, which has sparked off, as you might expect, a whole conversation about the rumored new Tarmac SL8 that may or may not be on the way this year. Mm. Anything on the There's UCI list yet? Nothing on the UCI list yet. It, it is five and a half, six minutes since I last checked it. So um, <laughs> I'll check it again in another three or four. But um, no, not nothing there yet. There was a link to a launch event scheduled for the 20th of April uh, from a, a Danish site posted within the same uh, Wait Winnie's thread. Uh, that seems a little soon. I would have expected something more in line with Tour de France. Um, and we haven't heard anything from Specialized yet. So um not sure. Perhaps, perhaps this uh, launch in Denmark is the new one piece handlebar and stem that we've seen some of the specialized writers using this year. Perhaps it is a new SL8. Uh, the good thing about the 20th April is it's only three days away. So we haven't got long to wait to find out, but I sort of doubt that that's the SL8 that soon. 
Well, I'm hoping that this podcast ages well because we are recording this on Monday and this isn't going to go live until Wednesday-ish or so. So we'll see what happens in the next couple of days. We could just do a little segment now. The SL8 has just been announced. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, rim brakes, uh, triple no, front. No, I think you read that wrong. It's yeah. lighter stuff for more aero. Um, yeah, it's the SL8. Uh, Ramco's <laughs> riding it in the A's this weekend. Yeah, that's mm, perfect. Perfect. Not much more to it. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it's gonna be. It's gonna be all black. It'll be labeled as their usual pro- pro- uh, Yeah, it'll be labeled as their usual project black. And uh, uh, yeah, and we contact Specialized for a comment, and they said no comment. So they're done. We're done. <laughs> uh, but no, oh, we're, but, we're set. Yeah. We're good to go. <laughs> but but seriously, I mean, it, it the the SL8 has. Oh, sorry. The, the SL7 has been around for a few years now, and so the fact that there is an SL8 kicking around potentially really shouldn't be any surprise at all. Um, I think the question, however, is given that we don't really know anything about this thing yet, what do we think it's going to be? Ooh, that's a good question. I think the just to your point on the timeline, if I remember correctly, SL7 came out July 2020. Uh, SL6, if I remember even further back, and I'm still remembering correctly, came out around the same time in 2017. So, you know, three years between them. Uh, we are, you you could say we're due a new a, a tarmac at this point. Um, I think the SL7 has actually aged quite well in you know, relative terms. It's only been three years, but uh, it's not looking as dated as perhaps uh, a three-year-old frame in the current um market could look at you know there are certainly frames that have that have not aged as well so um it's by no means sort of needed just yet but uh i don't think that'll change anything really if there's demand out there for it we're we're sure to see it what will it look like um you know without anything other than a guess to go off i would i would i would hesitate to guess that it will be sort of an an iteration rather than a sort of complete uh change in design so since the sl7 came out you've had the uci regulations on the three to one aspect ratio sort of relaxed a little bit so that might free up specialized designers to sort of you know do what we've seen a lot of manufacturers do in the last couple of years and that's you know go for a deeper head tube taller bottom brackets uh thinner narrower seat stays that sort of thing that won't be a radical overhaul but uh presumably will at least test a bit faster and um yeah, that, that that that's my guess. Um, the other rumors floating about it are that Specialized are also working on a new Venge. Whether those are true or not is anybody's guess. Uh, but I I don't think the SL8 will. I think the SL8 will sort of stick with the the what was the tagline? One bike to rule them all sort of approach rather than really going you know full on aero bike approach. There's got to be a new Venge coming. I mean, like. You can't spend 10 years saying aero is everything and then not have a pure aero bike, right? Particularly particularly with the new UCI regulations. Like, I, I mean, that's essentially what, what I was expecting is once those, you know, kind of kill the old bench in the expectation of these of these regulations being relaxed somewhat and then rebuild a new one under the new regulations and, and you know, it would look more like a new canyon or something like that. That's got to be coming as well, right? I mean, one would think, although if you look at how – Bike, how, how road bike development has been going with other brands. Um, you know, we, well, yeah, Specialized not too long ago when they came out with this SL7, they said basically the Venge was dead and they didn't need it. The SL7 is just as aero, if not, I think it was maybe even more so than the previous generation or than the last generation Venge. Um, I, I don't know if this will end up being a like more aero bike. I mean, Kaylee, I, I feel like, the way things are going now, especially with the way the UCI rules have relaxed, I think there is certainly room to reintroduce the Venge as just like a hyper aero road bike and to keep the Tarmac as sort of their kind of semi aero all rounder, kind of like what other companies have, like, you know, Giant with the um, uh, with the TCR and Trek with the Amanda. Um, I mean, it, they're, as far as like go fast road racing bikes go, it does seem like there is sort of, you know, logical space for three sort of different distinct lines yeah that's 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 what i'm expecting anyway i mean which then is a further argument for this sl8 being like you said ronan an iteration versus a, a sort of total redesign a couple more arrow tweaks and probably a bit lighter and stiffer and hopefully increased 
vertical compliance, hope, probably yeah, maybe a little more money, <laughs> maybe a little more money. <laughs> <laughs> uh, hope, hopefully a little easier to work on um, because obviously there was some teething teething issues with that integrated uh, integrated cable routing or hidden cable routing through the headset that they had that recall issue with. Um, so hopefully they've learned from that. And ooh, well, hold on, Ronan's putting his finger up. What do we got? Uh, I, sorry, I didn't realize you were wrapping up there. I was just going to say I reserve the right to completely change my opinion given – what Specialized have done with the Cirrus there of late um, and also the kind of the fact that uh, there was a lot of speculation that they would launch a new Rebay around the Classics this season. Uh, it has been a while since we've, uh, well, if you just if you just look at what they have at the moment, they've got the Athos and the SL7 and both of those bikes date back to, to 20, uh, I'm speaking strictly in terms of road here, but both of those frames date back to 2020 at this point now. Um, and you know, if I'm not saying they're going to do anything radical with the SL8, which I, it's, I find it very difficult not to say slate, but, uh, the SL8, um, I, I do think that there will be at least some sort of surprise in there, whether that's on timing or a complete change of, uh, tack and what they, what, what they actually come out with. I'm, I'm not sure exactly what it will be, but, um, as, as as much as a logical thing to do would be just you know deeper head tube, taller bottom bracket, all those things. Um, I I also just wouldn't be surprised if if you know if if, if I'm completely wrong, basically. I mean, I will say one thing: Specialized is exceptionally good at keeping its fans, uh, I guess, frothing a bit at whatever is coming next. So uh, whatever this SL8 is going to end up being, I think it's safe to say that it, they're going to sell another bucket load of those just like they have the SL7 and 6 and 5 and so on. Uh, so yeah, that, that's where we're at with that right now. If anyone listening to this has any inside knowledge on what this thing may or may not be, go ahead and drop us a line and maybe we'll talk about it on the next show. I rode my SL6 today. Which was still a fantastic bike. <laughs> Yeah, it was still it still is. I mean, like, I, it doesn't really matter what comes out. I'll not be selling that SL6 for uh, an upgrade to whatever it is. Because if I remember correctly, your SL6 is rim brake too, right? Yes, yes. Um, mm-hmm. uh, and now may be the opportune moment just to say that um, having spent the vast part of the past two years on different disc brake bikes, um, rim brake, carbon rims in the wet. No, that that, that do, do, just does not work. Still does not work. <laughs> like whoever said save the rim brake was wrong. Uh, and uh, R.I.P. my my mentions, my ads, but uh, whatever. <laughs> oh, we <laughs> can said it. Rodan, we can debate later in this show whether that whether that braking situation is more or less dangerous than the one that I was dealing with lately. So uh, we'll, well, we'll, we'll get to that. We'll get to that. <laughs> All right. Well, I'm just gonna not ride in the rain. Brandon. No rain. <laughs> no, then you're fine. I, I can't even. I can't even think of the last time I rode in the rain. It's all good. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. That's yeah. the key. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh-huh. No, no, you may have to leave where you live. I was gonna say no. No <laughs> difference in climates whatsoever between where you and I are and where Ronan is. Uh, all right. Mo- moving on. Um, we're gonna revisit a little bit of a topic that we talked about. Or I guess I didn't talk about because I wasn't quite involved yet. But when, at the end of February, but on the February 23rd episode of Geek Warning, um, uh, I talked about the kind of revised ETRTO guidelines. And ETRTO is the European organization that handles uh, basically wheel and tire safety across just vehicles in general. Um, but they uh, they just released some new guidelines talking about what the minimum recommended tire widths are for a particular, t- uh, for a particular inner rim width. And normally this isn't really something that's super newsworthy. It's kind of boring. It's all like technical mumbo jumbo. But what is particularly interesting, and this is something that we mentioned in February, uh, is those revisions have kind of left out zip in particular um, because on some of their wheels, they have a 25 millimeter inner width and they recommend tires as narrow as 28. And ETRTO is now saying that if you're running a, if you're running a 25 mil inner width rim, you should not be running a tire any smaller than 29 millimeters. So naturally, Zip has uh, they've taken a little bit of issue with this. I guess they don't agree. Um, but uh, what we have now is an official statement. Uh, so I'll go ahead and I'm just going to go ahead and read the statement here. So quote: As participants in the ETRTO standards meeting, we knew the compatibility table would change. We understand the updates, but they contradict our position. Zip has tested, designed, and developed several popular and professionally proven wheel sets with 23 and 25 millimeter internal widths. 
We know there have been enough wheel sets ridden in the past several years with the 28C tires on 25mm rims to prove that the combination is safe and delivers many proven performance benefits. And while the new compatibility table removes the combinations that Zip advocates for, the current table will move to a section of the ETRTO norm called PSD for previous standard data, demonstrating that those combinations are safe and can still be used. Unquote. Uh, what does that mean? So it's essentially the way that I am reading this is ETRTO is supposed to be they're the organization that is supposed to say what is and is not okay. And in this situation, they have now said that this combination that Zip advocates for is not okay by their books. Zip is saying that it is okay, but now there's a sort of addendum in the ETRTO, ETRTO guidelines saying essentially that we're saying this is not okay, but previous examples of this that seemingly were okay are maybe kind of still okay. Is this confusing to anyone besides me? <laughs> um yeah yes i, th I think I, th I, th I think another way of saying it is that uh going forward this will not work but for some miraculous reason going backwards it's fine <laughs> i mean it almost just seems like etrto is sort of just kind of like giving e giving zip a pass for a while like i it makes me wonder if this is just so like a temporary grandfathered in sort of thing we, we probably should say at this point that uh, the at least the zip rims that I know of that have a 25 millimeter internal are the 353 NSWs, but there is also the new NV 4.5 SES or SES 4.5s, which also have a 25 millimeter internal rim. So it's not exclusively or uh, solely zip rims that uh, have a 25 millimeter internal rim on what are sort of marketed as road wheels there's that, plenty of gravel wheels in that, that that have wider rims that is true and and i'm a big fan of the nv 4.5 uh ar uh which if i remember correctly also has roughly a 25 mil inner width but i think it's quite telling now looking back that nv recently revised their tire size selections so instead of like 28 and 30 now they're 29 and 31 um so they're okay and i don't know what zip is going to do again this is the statement that we have from zip at the moment um, but point being, there has been so much, con and, and I know this is something that I've harped about in the past, but there's so much confusion when it comes to road tubeless and what works and what doesn't work, hookless, non-hookless, so on and so forth, pressure guidelines. This does not help. No. <laughs> no, certain, certainly doesn't. Um, and adding more confusion to what was already a, a conf confusing subject for for many general users um, is not, I, I'm just thinking specifically of a few of my riding mates or a few people that I know that ride that, you know, the, the hookless and tubeless question is one that comes up repeatedly, you know, almost every time the tires need replaced, it's like, are these tires compatible with these wheels? And uh, adding, a, 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 that's as simple as actually something that is just described as hookless compatible or not hookless compatible if you then start to add if you then start adding in hookless compatible with 29 mil tires or hookless not hookless compatible with 28 mil tires adding numbers in there to what's already a confusing situation is not a good uh, not a good scenario kaylee you have a I, pained look on your face at the moment <laughs> yeah it's it's like part pained part angry uh <laughs> Like, I feel like I've ranted about this particular thing enough times in the last couple of years. Um, I th I just think it's a it's a shocking disregard for the safety of of the average consumer is the way is the way that the bike industry has comported itself over the last couple of years in, in this particular area. Um, like to the point where I'm I'm amazed that they haven't had their asses su sued off of them by the by now. Like uh, it it. The fact that it's so confusing, the fact that, you know, the three of us sitting here, it is literally our jobs to keep up with this sort of thing. And we're still sitting here going, what, what on earth are they talking about? It's yeah, it's, it's terrible. Like it's, it's, I don't know. I don't know how else to describe it. it it's, 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 uh, yeah, it's deeply irresponsible and, and yeah, just shockingly bad is, is the only way I can describe it. There... There is also, well, first of all, we are not aware of any, uh, or, or we at least cannot get proof of any situations where actually a 28 mil 
tire on a 25 millimeter internal resulted in any sort of failure or anything uh there's at least one or two rumors that i've had mentioned to me but without any sort of evidence to back them up or whatever so i'm not going to repeat them here but i think one of the other really sort of worrying things that may well develop out of this is just when when we have had a for at least a few years, 28 millimeter tubeless tires on these 25 millimeter internal rims and zip have been even suggesting that combination. What you inevitably will find here is a sort of, at least in, in some situations, sort of I'm trying to think of the right way to say it, but basically laughing it off or not really taking it too seriously. This new recommendation that you shouldn't have a 28 mil tire on a on a 25 millimeter internal rim and we've all heard it before where oh it'll be fine or it it's not it's not uh strictly compatible but it works fine or um you know we i think everybody i think you know that sort of what what i'm trying to say i just can't find the right way to say it right now but um what i would say is things like this are actually quite uh, important quite serious and should we should really take note of them. Um, and if ETRTO are saying now that a 28 millimeter tubeless tire, or we shouldn't use anything less than a 29 millimeter tubeless tire on a 25 millimeter internal, I will almost certainly be taking that very seriously and I won't, wouldn't run uh, anything below what they're recommending going forward, regardless of how well it worked previously. I guess for me, the thing that this comes down to is, um, and, and Kelly, I feel like you and I in particular I guess, and Zach have, and, and Rome in this particular subject, have, have talked a lot about like chain waxing, for example, how like it, in an ideal situation, it works really, really well. It's really good for a lot of things. Um, and, you know, but in the situations where it doesn't work well or for, for people that it's not ideal for, it just is not great. I feel like this is sort of a similar situation in which we, I, I can't say this for sure, but I, I just wonder if we have a situation where, Zip is looking at particular scenarios where they know that certain combinations work well, um, and in their opinion, it, it it's proven to be reliable enough that they are comfortable recommending it to people, which just says a lot considering you know the way U.S. liability laws work. Um, but yeah, whereas with chain waxing, if it's not ideal for someone, you just end up with a really gunky drivetrain or something. In this sort of situation, if it doesn't work well, you potentially end up with a tire that blows off and someone on the side of the road. And to yeah. That, when I say irresponsible, that's what I mean. It's like, and the, and the fact that that you know we've all had we've all had the exact same conversation numerous times where people are like, "Is the setup I'm running safe?" And you're like, "I don't know. <laughs> I would have to go look up a freaking chart on the internet, which is a ridiculous thing to have to do for a tire and a wheel." And and anyway, it makes me uh, it's very frustrating. really dislike really dislike hookless in general because i think that they they pushed it forward too quickly they didn't wait for the uh, sort of the tire manufacturing to catch up they didn't actually do their due diligence ahead of introducing this technology and i'm sure that people have crashed as a result right that, that there's they wouldn't be going through all this rigmarole right now if there was not a reason to do so uh and that's yeah that's just classic dipshit bike industry stuff and it it annoys me the the example I couldn't quite bring to mind a second ago, but I remember now is is the Roval Rapids. You no, know, obviously they were not hookless, but when Roval launched those wheels, they said these are not tubeless compatible, and everybody looked at them and said they're clearly tubeless compatible. They're clearly designed for tubeless, and we had a year and a half or two years questioning why are these not compatible? Why are these not compatible? And meanwhile, on the internet, everybody not everybody, but a lot of people saying on the internet. They're fine. I've run them tubeless. They're fine. They're fine. They're fine. And then we eventually find out that Roval could not, uh, it, it could could not specify that these work with tubeless tires because Sagan of all people managed to explode one of these wheels when they had it running uh, tubeless previously, and that's the same sort of that sort of idea that it's fine. It's fine. It's designed for this. It'll work fine. Never mind the never mind what the the regulations say is exactly what I would be afraid of creeping in here again. And you know the Roval has nothing to do with what we're talking about here now. It's just a perfect example that came to mind there. No, if anything, kudos to Roval for actually probably I mean, designing a, a wheel as one, a tubeless. What was that? 
I mean, they could have told us day one, but um, they could yeah. have explained in more detail day one. But they still like they 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 made the probably difficult decision to 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 say that these wheels weren't tubeless. And kudos to them for th- looking after the security and safety of their riders ahead of what was definitely not a PR coup. Uh, and <laughs> I like that. <laughs> That's not, uh, not their finest moment. That, not their finest moment. Um, I mean, it depends on what way you look at, at it because Kelly does make a good point. They had been pushing tubeless, 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 and then they turn around and say, let's, let's tubeless for a second. When the easier thing to do would have been, let's, let's just, these will be fine for most people. Let's just roll with it. Right. Because they probably would have been fine for most people. Well, I <laughs> right? mean, as, no. as the internet proves. Yeah. But, but to, to their, to their credit, to their credit, they, they, yes, they, they didn't say why that they didn't approve these for tubeless when they were clearly meant to be tubeless. Um, so that, that's the whole, the whole story that we got only what a year ish later or whatever, but they at least did say, do not run these things tubeless. Like they at yeah. least, they at least didn't say like, Oh, they're fine. <laughs> yeah. That's run, what I meant. That's what I meant tubeless. to the credits. Yeah. Run these tubeless if you weigh less than 65 kilos. You'll be fine. Yeah. You'll be okay. <laughs> and, all right. And you if you ride slower pups. than Peter Sagan, you'll be all right. Uh, yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, uh, continuing on this vein of things that are trying to kill us, um, I, I, uh, I, I, just, I just wrapped up a review of that, uh, that crazy uh, Indiegogo crowdfunding bike, the Superstrata. Um, and this is something that Ian had written about at the other place uh, quite some time ago. But – um, th- that campaign ran on Indiegogo about three years ago. Uh, not quite three years ago. I think it's like I think it wrapped up in like October 2020 or something like that. But um, anyway, that campaign wrapped up almost three years ago, and it pulled in a ridiculous amount of money. It was over seven million dollars US, and it was backed by something like forty five hundred people or something like that. Um, it was this crazy three D printed carbon fiber frame road bike uh, with drop bars or flat bar. You could do it uh, with e-bike motor or without e-bike motor the biggest thing about it though was that it was custom 3d printed supposedly custom fit for every person who was going to get one and it had no seat tube um but they had all these crazy claims it was going to be like a 1.3 kilo frame which is like not crazy light but pretty reasonable um they were saying that the whole bike was going to be something like uh, i don't remember seven something kilos something pretty pretty reasonable um and the the kickstarter prices were I mean, it was a lot of money for, I think, for a casual cyclist or someone who's just not really into bike riding. Um, but the big draw for this thing was that it, like, to the casual onlooker, it looked really, really cool. That it basically looked like the future. Um, and, uh, you know, I don't know if uh, the parent company who was making Superstrata or Revo, they're, they're specialists in 3D printing. Um, I don't know if they really could have foreseen how all this, you know, how the pandemic would have affected the bike industry, but it clearly didn't affect them very well when it came to the Superstrata um, because uh, reviewing the actual product that is being delivered to people, this thing is, it, I'm just going to go ahead and say it, like it, it is far and away the worst bike I have ever had to test by a, by a wide, wide margin. Um <laughs> Damn, there goes our Super Strata advertising. Uh, yeah, pity. <laughs> really pity. bummed. Yeah, con- considering <laughs> considering at this point, I can't even get a response back from the company to like just get the thing out of my garage. And like, this is not very encouraging <laughs> to me right now. Um, but I mean, I, like the the shipping for a bike that weighs that much must be absolutely colossal. So they're maybe they're maybe just not going to lift it. Oh yeah, yeah. I mean, there, I I can't even begin to, to go through the missteps and errors that that have gone gone on with this thing. First of all, the frame ended up being like two and a half times the weight that it was supposed to be. Um, it was supposed to be yeah, like thirteen hundred grams or so, and mine was, uh, I think it was over three kilos. It was like three point one. It, it, it basically weighs the same as my one hundred and forty mil travel, like it like trail bike. It, it, it's it's and and my and my particular trail bike i've got an evil offering those things are not renowned for being super light and this thing weighs more than that oh that's fantastic um so but they're all yeah again i, also, I mean that's impressive to actually get it to weigh that much it, it, it is <laughs> it's gotta just it be is. like solid it has uh, you to be know, solid. i, I kind of yeah. wondered but the, like, like you know they use the same they use the same frame for the e-bike version and the non-e-bike version and there's a there's a little hatch in the bottom of the bottom bracket where you can insert the battery and I mean, I tried to pop off the hatch to see if there's actually a battery in there to explain why the thing was so heavy. Um, but the hatch was glued shut. Uh, so, <laughs> and like, as far as I could tell, there was, you know, l- looking up through the, the cable routing ports and stuff like that, there was no battery in there that I could see. So this thing is just 
like solid, quote unquote, industrial carbon fiber. You need a UCI iPad to check if there's a battery in there. <laughs> I, I mean, I, I, yeah, maybe there's a battery in there or maybe it's just like filled with lead shot. I don't know. But in addition to it being super heavy, those, those 3D printed carbon fiber wheels that they offered never came to be. So there are a whole bunch of people who paid for, who paid a lot extra for them who have still not gotten their money back. Um, and then the, 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 the stock build kit that was supposed to be a bunch of pretty decent Shimano stuff uh, ended up being – that uh, because essentially Arivo was so far down on the list of orders at the time when the bike, when the, you know, during the COVID fueled bike boom was going on, uh, they basically just couldn't even get on the list. So instead of running a bunch of Shimano stuff, they just, it, it's almost like they went on a shopping spree on, at, at Alibaba. So it's like L2 shifters and derailers and like a sunshine cassette. And they have uh, the crank sets badged as an RRP. Uh, well, actually, well, RRP is the model, but it's it's made by Promax, which is uh, sort of like a lower end OEM supplier. Um, you know the the wheels they weigh over two kilos for the set. Um, they're running the absolute worst Kenda tires I've ever seen. They're twenty two TPI steel bead clinchers. <laughs> they, that weigh that weigh they're twenty eight they're labeled twenty eight mil wide, uh, and they weigh nearly six hundred grams a piece. I took the whole bike apart. <laughs> Uh, you know, it, it's just stuff. It's just it's there's there's stuff all over the place. It's it was supposed to be 100 percent 3D printed carbon fiber, but uh, I, I don't know if they didn't put it in the engineering or didn't put in the time or whatever. But there are aluminum inserts in the head tube and the seat tube uh, and the bottom bracket, so like they couldn't figure out how to do all this in carbon fiber. Uh, there are these giant giant aluminum uh, dropout inserts because they use the same frame for both 142 and 48 and 148 space rear hubs. Um, it, <laughs> I, I could go on and on and on. It, it's just it's just a nightmare. But the the thing the thing where this thing actually tried to kill me is when I was taking the bike apart. Um, they're they're using uh, I don't I can't even I couldn't even figure out exactly who is making these brake calipers. That, but they're these mechanical to hydraulic um, flat mount calipers that are absolutely massive. Like no joke, it, it, it's like the size of a deck of cards for a caliper. It's it's stupidly big. Um, but the most offensive part is that. They put this bike together with derailleur cable and housing for the brakes instead of brake cable and housing, which uh, I, I will say that in like very, very, very early on in my like self tinkering and bike shot days and whatever, I'm like, oh, you know, this, this housing is a lot stiffer and a lot less prone to compression. I bet this would make my brakes feel really good. And it does until the strands explode because they're not designed to handle compressive loads. Um, and the... You know, anyone who's worked on their own bike, they, they 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 would know right away that the head on a derailleur cable is a lot smaller than a brake cable, and that's by design. Um, it's not supposed to fit in the brake lever seat. And to whoever at Superstrata put this thing together, they modified the setup. They they basically took some some Shimano hydraulic, um, some some yeah some Shimano hydraulic brake hose barbs, cut off the pointy end, and then used it as a washer. Put that on the cable to keep that from the to keep it keep it from you know to keep the head from pulling through the lever, um, but that that thing's that thing's brass. It's not super strong. It's not designed to handle load. The cable itself is not designed to handle load, and I'm really happy I didn't take this thing down any big descents where I where I would have had to you know use a bunch of really hard, hard heavy braking because no joke if any other super stratos are built like this someone is going to get either severely hurt or killed. Hey, <laughs> that's terrifying. Like, I mean, what do you even, <laughs> what do you even say to that? If anybody out there has purchased one of these, I can't imagine anybody that's listening to this podcast has purchased one of these. If you know anybody who purchased one of these, please stop them, get them to take it to a bike shop and entirely rebuilt. Basically. I, 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 I would agree that probably nobody listening to this podcast has bought one but what i would say is that everybody listening to this podcast should share james's review to get the word out to uh anybody who may you know the whole six degrees of separation thing and all that let's all just try and get the word out as far and as wide as we can that these things there should be there should be a stop ride notice on these bikes yeah and a, and a recall i mean i've written that in the review uh, I mean, we were talking about this internally. I, I don't like, I, I guess I can file a report with CPSC or something, but I guess the issue right now is I have no idea if other bikes were built this way. I, I can say with a fair degree of certainty, however, looking at the, the zoomed in images that I looked at, that 
the uh, the the bike that Bike Radar reviewed also was built with derailleur cable and housing. Um, so that's terrifying. So at, there's at least one other one that went out there, and these were media bikes. Keep in mind. Um, so I mean, the likelihood of some consumers' bikes being also like this is seemingly greater than zero. Um, but at this point, I mean, I, 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 you know, months ago I had been texting back and forth with the Arivo CEO, Sonny Vu. Uh, I've texted him several times and he hasn't written back. Um, I haven't been able to get a hold of anyone at Superstrata just yet. I'll keep trying. But in the meantime, I mean, all I can really do is just scream to everyone at this point that this bike is unsafe and whoever has one basically should stop riding it until they can have it inspected. The scary thing is probably the majority of people that bought this bike are not uh, they have no reading, idea reading cycling websites all that often no but they but a lot of them probably are looking at the the facebook group for the super strata backers uh and i have been posting there um so i mean there's no way that I, i'm sure that doesn't reach all of the backers and i have no way of accessing the database of people who have backed this thing through indiegogo because i didn't run the campaign um and i also can't post a comment on there because i didn't back it um, but if anyone listening to this is a backer, please post a message or comment to that Indiegogo page. And you, I, I've also reached out to a couple of backers to send me some contact info for someone at Superstrata so I can get a hold of someone there. Um, but yeah, this thing needs to be, I, at least for the ones that are built with drop bars, uh, the flat bar bikes, thankfully are built with hydraulic brakes. So that, that shouldn't be an issue, but, um, th- this thing shouldn't be on the road. Oof. Well, now we we finally have a definitive answer. Uh, whenever we get asked, "What's the worst bike you guys have ever reviewed?" That's the one, and it's going to be that way for probably at least a decade. I would hope it's not even inexpensive. It's twenty eight hundred dollars retail. This thing's a pile of garbage. Meanwhile, I've got the new uh, Imanda ALR sitting in my shed, and that is a similar price and is fantastic. So maybe buy from. A reputable, a reputable brand reputable bicycle <laughs> manufacturer yeah uh, that's that's what i was just going to say is that you know for the amount of hard time that we we give the industry um they actually kind of know what they're doing most of the time you know bar about that whole tire thing that we were just talking about a second ago um most of the rest of the time they actually let's give them credit where it's due do a, do a lot better job than the super strata um and unfortunately everything you were talking about there james like the incredible weight the you know how it was some of the, the the parts on it were just not what you were expecting um and then safety issues for you was derailleur housing and, and cables and, and your brakes took me back incredibly unfortunately took me back to my days of working in schools with kids and some of the bikes that you see kids uh you know obviously their their parents maybe not into cycling have gone into a local probably not a local bike shop, but probably uh, somewhere that sells bikes. Let's put it that way rather than a bike shop and bought what they thought was a perfectly good bike for their kid. And actually, you know, the amount of times I've had to spend half an hour, an hour trying to fit, fix a kid's bike as best I could um, because it either had brakes. It just did not work. It had forks that were put on in reverse effectively, you know, instead of being the way they should be, they were pointing backwards uh, and the list goes on and on and on. So, um, yeah, a reminder as well, just that um, unfortunately these sorts of builds are a common occurrence in kids' bikes, which is terrifying. Yeah, yeah, yeah. F- fingers crossed, Superstrata doesn't go into kid bikes. Although I will say that the uh, that parent company Arevo, R E A R E V O, that I mentioned, uh, they have run another Indiegogo campaign since this one that was successfully funded. Uh, for a a motorized scooter called the Scotsman, and uh, I dare say people listening to this podcast may be familiar with my unfortunate incident with a scooter mm. a few years ago. So, needless to say, I am not a fan of this. If you had been on a Scotsman that time, you could have been the flying Scotsman. <laughs> <laughs> Who are train aficionados? They'll they'll know of the flying Scotsman. Uh, oh my goodness. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, all all right. right. Moving on. <laughs> Moving on. Anyway, <laughs> head out to escapecollective.cc and read that review, please. Uh, yeah. Even if you don't have one, if you don't know anyone who has one, it's like it's a it's a case study in what not to do. Anyway, uh, moving on. Moving on. Um, we got a little bit of tech news going on here. A couple of interesting releases. Um, Mavic 
Speaking of wheels and stuff like that, they seem to be back uh, after an awful lot of turmoil with buyouts and companies going under and so on and so forth. Um, yeah, they seem to be back. That they seem to be back, but maybe not where you think they would be um, because they have. Uh, they're apparently working on an e-bike motor, which is exactly what you would expect from Mavic. Um, but they are they are working on an e-bike motor uh, primarily for road and gravel. The design looks interesting. Um, it is something that it, it's quite small. Um, it, so it actually integrates pretty well into uh, a kind of pretty regular bike profile. Um, don't have a lot of stats as far as like power and that sort of thing. Um, but one thing that's really cool is that there is a way to run a standard crank set on it, um, which is very intriguing. That That's something that you have not been able to do with any other mid-drive motor setup. Um I am very curious to see what happens here. And I'm also really curious why Mavic is moving into e-bike motors, although maybe they're just like, this is where there is opportunity and growth in the market. And this is where we maybe need to kind of become relevant again, because at this point, unfortunately, they have, they're so far behind the curve on wheels that I don't know if they could ever come back to being a prominent player in their, what was their core competency. Mm. Yeah. I mean, it would take, it would take them looking forward a couple of years and, and, you know, one mark, one marquee product, I think could pull them back given the history of the brand. And like, and the fact that, you know, we've said this numerous times, it's one of those brands that, that we sit around and we sort of cheer for. Right. And we've watched it go through a lot of issues over the last couple of years, some of which were its own doing, but a lot of which were not right. A lot of it, a lot of which were just businesses being bought and sold and, and, and sort of the, the after effects of, of all of that. Um, who actually owns them now? Who owns them? Is it I still? honestly have no idea. Because it's not Amher Sports anymore. It is not. Uh, I it, think they're they're still based in Honesty. Uh, I'm guessing just based purely off the fact that like that was why when I lived there, got to know a couple of the Mavic guys quite well and like follow them on Strava and things like that. And they're still posting rides from from the same place. They haven't left. Uh, but they're still working for Mavic. So yeah, I don't know worth digging into we should uh we should find out exactly what's going on kind of internally over there yeah for sure um i mean like you said i mean mavic is definitely a brand that we that we certainly root for so much history they have done a lot of good stuff in the past and it would be great to see them come back um i would like to see them come back with wheels though and maybe not with e-bike motors but um Anyway, th- that that kind of leads into the, the next thing I wanted to talk about, though, because uh, this is going to be very much related. Um, the the brand Muckoff, who really got into the space with like cl- bicycle cleaning products, essentially, hence the name. Um, they they sent me a press release the other day that had just a bunch of random stuff included. They introduced new waterproof socks, a metal toolbox, and absorbent bike mat that you just like the mat that you just keep your bike on. You, Put it on there when your bike is wet after a ride, I guess. Uh, and also color anodized plugs for your drop bar handlebars. Um, what is up with brands who feel the need to expand into all sorts of weird product categories that they're just not like – that is just not like who they are necessarily. Like you know, speaking of Mavic – uh, like we look at you know, Mavic, one of the reasons that they went under is they went beyond wheels and they went into like clothing and helmet and shoes. Um, and then like Silka, you know, Josh Portner, I think is one of the smartest guys in the bike industry. And I think Silka makes a bunch of really cool stuff, but they have like lube and now like tire sealant and uh, 3D printed titanium computer mounts and tools and socks. Like, I don't get it. I mean, my, my assumption is they're just going after higher margin stuff, right? Like, I mean, that was the Mavic play. The Mavic play with helmets and shoes and kit was that helmets and shoes and kit have way better margins uh, and usually much higher volume than hard goods like wheels. And so it, it made some business sense from that perspective to, to drop into that stuff. And and to be honest, like some of the Mavic stuff I have from that era, like they, they launched a, a gravel uh, kind of like kit. It was good a, a couple of years ago. That was really good. Like I, the the base layer is one of the best that I have. I still wear it. Uh, so it wasn't necessarily a, a product problem for them. And and I think that you know, as is the case of Muckoff, like I'm sure their handlebar plugs are top notch. Uh, but I'm not sure that I'm not sure that it really fits the brand. Other other than you know, trying to trying to diversify. 
I don't know. None of us are business professors here. I don't think we should sit here and try to pretend otherwise, but uh, it, it, I don't know if they feel like they've filled their core competency, they're doing all of the things that get muck off of your bike as well as they possibly can. I could see, I could see a need to expand into the random things. I, it just seems odd because like, you don't see Ford diversifying into like betting or like, <laughs> you know, house plants or like, you know, Hey, we're going to launch an airline. It's just odd. I just don't get it. It is a bit, it's a bit. Yeah. I'm not, I'm not saying it's uh, what I would do, <laughs> but, but I can, I can see yeah, I, can, I, I can see why, why brands do it mostly, mostly in this sort of like going from a low margin product to a higher margin product which muck off is like I, oh, I would think that cleaning things and lubes and things are already relatively high margin you're just filling uh, a six thousand pound chains yeah six thousand that yeah. like i mean that 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 they're probably move, not moving a whole lot of volume <laughs> <laughs> two, two i think two if yeah. i recall correctly three three yeah yeah but like you know the bottles of cleaner is mostly water uh which is quite cheap and I I can't imagine that the you know the margins are too bad and stuff like that. So it's it's a bit of a bit of an interesting one. Maybe they've just got like a huge fan base whose skin on their feet is not already waterproof enough, so they want socks to further waterproof their feet and like the muck off logo. Possibly trying to trade on the brand. Yeah, I, you know we sit here uh, at Escape Collective and like we're about to dive headlong into mountain bikes right you yeah but, but that's a different kind of that. but like there's like they're it's still the same group and like they're so similar they're just like two different types of bikes you when we've made the argument before that gravel bikes are sort of just crappy old mountain bikes <laughs> i mean it's kind of it's kind of the same thing but it'd be <laughs> i think it'd be more akin to us going into something like you know escape collective cats.com we're gonna have like nothing but <laughs> nothing but cat content <laughs> that is on the roadmap, James. That's on the roadmap. Uh, I mean, spe- speaking need- of higher margin stuff, I mean that that's that's yeah. where the internet's at. We need a lot more members before we get into cats. Mm. Uh, I, I'm thinking, or maybe that's somewhere how- in the, or maybe that's how we two- get more members. Uh, maybe we should move it up in the roadmap. Ooh. I don't know. Ooh, hey. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> there, there is actually an extensive list of of muck off off bike and on bike uh, products already. There's. All weather changing robes, cases and wallets, face masks, grind bags, hats, caps, t-shirts, sweaties, sweaters, hoodies, and there's a whole lot of on bike clothing as well. So, um, and of course, they already do like a, you know a lot of motorcycle uh, cleaning products. That you know, there, there's obviously a direct link between bike cleaning and motorcycle cleaning. So that that's fine. But um, this is by no means the first. Uh, deviation into this sector for Mokov. Yeah, I just think they're diversifying. They're just like adding stuff because they can. I, I mean, I, I, I don't have any problem with it. I hope they're I hope they're just having a good time over there and having fun with it. Um, I mean, I, I don't know if they're going to be at the Sea Otter show uh, this coming week, but maybe I'll see them there and I'll see what I'll see what sort of expansive range of products they have over there. And I'll I'll, I'll catalog it all for you. You need to report back on their bar plugs. I'll just, I I'll, want to know about the bar I'll, plugs. I'll just have an entire catalog, entire tech gallery devoted to muck off products. It'll be like a hundred <laughs> images. <laughs> they would love that. I'm sure. <laughs> I'm sure they would. <laughs> All right, let's uh, let's let's wrap up the news and everything here. Do, do you guys, do you guys have anything on your mind this week that may be over the head of your parents? Um, you threw me a little bit when you said over the head of my parents, but. Uh... <laughs> Family, uh, sorry, I got the tagline <laughs> wrong. Excuse me. Um, I, I'm new I, here, Ronan. I'm new. Having having sat out last FNG. week trying to recuperate some some much needed sleep, I want to just say that uh, Ergo, as a former Ergo Brain button user and Flight Deck user way back in the day, a button does not replace a thumb paddle. Just no, guys. No, that's 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 one thing I need to clear up from last week's podcast. There was a few <laughs> other things, but I'll let I'll let those slide, and I'll just say a button is not a paddle. That's Speaking all. Speaking of which, that reminds me, I did forget we did have a corrections corner this week. I totally oh. forgot about that because it was pointed out that I was talking about the uh, speaking of Campagnolo, um, we were talking about the 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 recall with with open bikes and the Campagnolo Ekar hydraulic hoses. Um, and I had mentioned that, uh, I had said that those bikes have like this little multi-port, uh, cable entry thing behind, behind the stem. And, and, and my apologies, I was conflating open and three T, which 
in my defense, it's easy to do because they're both Gerard Vrooman brands. But anyway, um, the open bikes have a port kind of down on the side of the down tube, as you would expect for, you know, as is kind of more common with a lot of bikes. Anyway, either way, point being, those things are still recalled if you have a Campagnolo hose. So go, go get a new port, maybe a new hose. Anyway, that's the corrections corner. I, 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 I could also sort of say that you know i have a reputation for how little i did crash but you know i'm going to let that slide that was another thing you just brought up last week and and, and i want to get into what i actually want to talk about which is sort of related to one of dave rome's articles recently on um things bike fillers want you to know uh i'm going to say sort of related this is maybe something bike fillers don't want you to know but i've figured out a nice little hack for adjusting or, or at least checking my bike fit uh, with no bike fitters nearby and you know multiple bikes that i'm having to set up quite often and it involves what we're sitting on here now which is google meet uh, and i effectively set up a three-way google meet with myself uh, and three different devices and then hit record on one screen Ooh. and i've got an angle from side on from head on and from behind uh, with just myself feeling a little bit like mr bean writing himself postcards or christmas the, cards the poor um, man's retool the poor man's retool well R- so ronan, you- <laughs> ronan what i would like to know is you know seeing as how you have to ha- ha- set up different google accounts for the different google meet windows what what are your no, no. what are your alter egos uh well i mean you i'm gonna have to yourself. go and think up some alter egos now but you, you don't even have to do that you just if you're using three devices on the oh. that are yours i i i've uh three apple products so i just copy and paste uh the the meat link um across across them and then command shift number five key uh click record and um, i will say that an hour's worth of recording is about 53 gigabytes uh so you might not <laughs> want to record your entire session <laughs> uh but what you can do with quicktime player is play it back on uh you know half speed or whatever and yeah just uh that's I, I've, I've been having a lot of fun with that whoa clever <laughs> Why, uh, I, why am I not surprised at all that you have been doing this? <laughs> not, not the least bit surprised. Yeah. I, I will say one uh, thing. We certainly have assembled quite a quirky crew of people here at Escape Collective. <laughs> I, I'll say I, it's I actually, most useful for time trial position checking. I, just while, while we were making this episode, I sent you a screenshot, Ronan, on Slack. Um, I, right. was driving, I was driving back from dropping my wife off at the airport earlier today and did one of those like, ah, oh, idea. And it popped into my head and I took a voice note uh, and then I just sent you a, like, basically it, it auto transcribed my voice note. The voice note is a podcast focused on training or maybe tech called the process that Ronan runs. And I think this is a good idea. I think it's like stuff like this, like this should be its own weird, quirky stuff that you do to make yourself a better bicycle rider. I think could be worth of its own occasional podcast mm. series oh i like the, i like the be, name uh, i like the name for that too gaily i think it might be best served as a like i have made these mistakes so that you don't have to uh, sort of, <laughs> <laughs> sort of a but podcast. that's the process that's the process i mean like i was just thinking we don't need to talk about this this is more like a meeting now um than than a, than a podcast yes. <laughs> but, but i was going to talk about this with you some some other time but you know maybe the listeners out there can give us some feedback i was sort of thinking like you would give us some insight into your process, but we'd also, it would be an opportunity to go talk with other people about their process. The other thing that kind of made me think of this was, uh, was you mentioning Ben Healy, uh, who, you know, had a great ride at Amstel, uh, last weekend and, and Brabant's appeal the or Wednesday beforehand. And, um, you mentioned the fact that he was, he's quite like into aerodynamics and, and working with Dan Bigham and, and process in its general stuff, right? Like, it, it chat with people like that or taco vanderhorn i want i want to i want to sit down with taco vanderhorn and talk like how the hell did you end up here right like what are all the iterations <laughs> what were all the things that you did anyway it's like well I, one time i crashed and the lever got bent in and then i had just hop, hop, <laughs> like, there was no neutral there was no neutral card i just had to hop on and then it turned out that it was really good <laughs> anyway maybe mm. this is something we launch i don't know if uh let's call it let's call it 200 of you Sign up for escapecollective.cc uh, in the next 48 hours. <laughs> hmm. we'll, launch, we'll launch this this podcast product 
with Ronan. Are, are we, uh, are we you'll get, have no way of knowing whether we actually do that. <laughs> I'm just, just going to make it up in a couple days. Are we? Are we like, gonna, oh, we just missed it. <laughs> are we going to toss in a toaster too? Do it like the old, old, old school bank days. If you open a bank account yeah. with us now. <laughs> mm-hmm. oh, I'm, 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 dat- uh, I'm dating myself right there. Very much dating uh, myself. Don't, I got don't you. bring up toasters in this podcast. It's a touchy subject. <laughs> <laughs> They're not what they used uh, anyway, to be. Moving on, moving, moving on, on. Moving sorry on. for derailing us there. Sorry for derailing us. That's that's why we have you on here, Kaylee. <laughs> uh, I have one. Oh, what you got? So, so in a in, a, in an earlier episode, I think we were talking about this in like February. Uh, I mentioned the fact that I'm doing the Iron Horse Bicycle Classic, uh, which, full disclosure, since we first talked about it, and now I have joined the board <laughs> of this event. So I don't know. Just disclosure. That's that's not why I'm talking about it, but it's just the reality. Um, it's a it's an awesome sort of road race that starts here in Durango and finishes in Silverton. So you go over two big mountain passes, and I was talking about like what's the best setup for for me. And we basically decided I have this this specialized Athos and run that with some fast wheels was probably my best bet. Um, however, I wanted to just provide an update on this, which is that I've decided to instead turn that bike into a gravel bike, uh, and I will be riding my mosaic <laughs> at the. <laughs> So I've, I've, instead of riding the optimized Athos with fast wheels, I d- decided I don't really care. And I'm going to run the 18 pound travel bike with SNS couplers uh, and a power meter that reads 80 watts high or 80 watts low on any given day, uh, depending <laughs> on <laughs> depending on the wind. Is, is that what, Kelly, power meter. Kelly, is that why you never said thank you for me handing off that power meter to you? <laughs> yeah, it's, it's not particularly useful. I mean, some, some days it makes me feel great. <laughs> and some days it makes me feel real sad. Oh, so okay. <laughs> we're just going to hope for a great day uh, uh, for the Iron Horse. And But I guess the, the thing that's been on my mind is I've been trying to figure out uh, essentially how big a tire I can fit in the Athos first and foremost. But then also what tire I should run at that size. I think I can fit roughly like a 33, 34. Uh, I've read that on the internet and just by looking at it, that looks like about what I can do. And so I, I was wondering if either of you have a suggestion for a, like, I don't even really need knobs, right? I don't really need tread almost like a, like a, so Belgian waffle ride in San Diego was this weekend. You could see a lot of the fast guys were running like 32 or 34, just fully slicks. And that's kind of what I'm thinking for this bike and just make it my like essentially dirt road bike as opposed to, you know, needing actual sort of gravel stuff. Cause there's a lot of that around here. Maxis, uh, was it the refuse was one of my options, I think. Uh, yeah, I've actually used a refuse. I'm hesitant to say this. I'm pretty certain I've used the refuse on sort of gravel route that we have around here. Um, and, and ripped it pretty quick. So depending on what type of gravel, you know, that was, that was fire track. So, you know, really to be fair to the tire, I, it was, it was beyond its comfort zone, I would say. Yeah. I, I mean, I'm, it's really rocky around here. So I need something with a good sidewall and I think I'm going to run at least a rear insert. I think, uh, because it's not, I'm not going to have a huge volume tire because it won't, that bike won't fit it. It's still a road bike. Right. Mm. Um, Anyway, that's that's what I've been I've been pondering. What because I'm going to go buy tires with my own money, and as somebody in the bike industry, that's not something I have to do all that often. But I'm going to go do this and uh, want to make sure that I don't have to do it twice. Basically, have you I, like I kind of caught us on the hop here? So I, I'm not really that's what I like. To, that's what I like to do. <laughs> but have you considered like a challenge cyclocross tire of some sort? Would that maybe? Just thinking well, as to what that you have to play with, and you might it might just give you a bit of versatility. So, like a semi slick with a bit of side knob. Yeah, if I the mean, side knobs. If the side knobs sat for, far enough down the tire that I'm not riding on them, unless I'm cornering. Well, I right? I was thinking something like a Schwabe G1 RS, um, but mm. that only comes down to a 35, which doesn't sound like it'll fit in your frame. No, I mean maybe, but probably not. I, it'd be like, it would be it'd be tight 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 <laughs> it would definitely be not to spec we'll put it that way of no help to you right now whatsoever but i've done a similar thing with the trek domani where i've put uh the kdex gravel tires in there and it's basically what mm-hmm. you're describing mm-hmm. uh but the domani is rated for 38 mil of clearance actually takes 40s pretty comfortably um and yeah that 
your ethos will not do that. But I guess yeah. the big thing, I guess the big thing uh, with that ethos, well, that, that ethos, I think, will, have you tried a 35 in there? I have a 35 Conti tire, which are beautiful like gum wall. Well, they're, they're fake gum walls, but, you know, uh, I was going to just try it because I don't, I don't know. I, I think it'd be really tight, like just eyeballing it. It would be really tight. Well, another, it all depends on how big it blows up with the rims that I've got. Sure, of uh, course. I mean, another option, uh, Ronan, you mentioned South Cross tires. Um, Challenge makes a, a tire called the Dune um, in, a, mm-hmm. in a tubeless clincher, and that is essentially yep. like a little diamond tread down the middle. Uh, it, it's essentially like a, a, a South Cross sand tire, essentially. Right. Um, and it comes Ooh. in a 33 because it's a cross tire. Uh, comes in a tubeless clincher. Might work. That, that's exactly what I was thinking of. Yeah, uh, yeah. very. I like. Well, entirely different, but sort of similar looking to the KDX that I mentioned there. I like the look of that a lot. That's yeah. That's that's. I'll give. I'll question. Last time I used Challenge tires was when I was a crit rat in like 2009, and they sponsored the team that I was riding for, and we had to stop using them because the tread kept falling off mm. in like one ride. Mm. <laughs> They, that's they, not, they seem, that's they not seem the better challenge now. anymore. The challenge is the challenge is getting them on and off. <laughs> <laughs> All right, good to know. <laughs> they, they they seem better now, Kaylee. Okay, that's all I've got. That's all I've got on my mind. So I, I problem mostly solved, and uh, I look forward to riding the Iron Horse on my heavy metal bike. <laughs> well, we will. <laughs> Which, we'll we'll have to check in and see what you ended up with for tires, because I yes. I have I have visions of you sticking those dunes on there like the night before the race, realizing that they don't quite fit and that they rub just a little bit and you coming back with like a hole in your chain stay. <laughs> also possible. Now that you're on the board, can I recommend that you, uh, you know, maybe get, I don't know, so someone who, to come and do the race, like a, not really a guest appearance, so to speak, but maybe a guest of the race. Uh, someone who, I don't know, someone from maybe an Irish fellow <laughs> who used to do a bit of racing. Um, yeah. Maybe, do you maybe think just you could beat? Bring that up a bit. No, no, no. I couldn't beat any. I'll, do you, you know, I could maybe beat you. Simmons that won last year. Uh, <laughs> do, do, do you think yeah. you could show up on a functional bike? <laughs> I mean, <laughs> that might be pushing him. That might be pushing him. <laughs> Uh, yeah, and and, we, and you, you start at 2,000 meters, go up well over three twice, uh, mm. and then finish at like 25. So I'll, I'll need be to be there for at least three weeks in. Yeah. Yeah, I think yeah. so. Well, yeah. I mean, you're, you're going to invite Ronan there, except he's going to kind of go into like autopilot mode, and he's going to go up the first climb, get to the top, turn, turn around, go back to the bottom, <laughs> and just keep doing the same climb over and over again. <laughs> James, anything on your mind? What's on your mind? <laughs> I, I do have something on my mind because another bike review that I am wrapping up right now is uh, I'm doing a, doing a little comparison of uh, basically Canyon's most expensive Ultimate model and their least expensive Ultimate model. So I'm comparing the Ultimate CFR and the Ultimate CF SL7. So one of them, the SL7, it comes with stock uh, Shimano 105 mechanical and these kind of like ho-hum DT Swiss mechanical, uh, DT Swiss and aluminum wheels. It weighs like eight and a quarter kilos, costs 2,700 euros. Uh, and then the Ultimate CFR, wicked light. It's 6.3 kilos, costs 10 and a half thousand euros, comes with Dura ASDI 2, DT Swiss, Mon a uh, bunch of other super, like super light, go fast goodies. Um, but I was curious, like, you know, of course, you know, th- we expect diminishing returns as you go up in price. But we have here a disparity of almost four times. Uh, and like, you know, how good could the least expensive bike be with just like maybe one upgrade or something? So, uh, I called up our friends at hunt and they supplied me a set of their, uh, pretty much entry level alloy SL disc wheels. They're pretty inexpensive aluminum disc wheels, but they're pretty light. Um, they're like 1400 grams and change, like 1450, something like that. Took off 420 grams off of the wheel set alone for, for that CF SL7. So now what I have here, uh, after spending 560 euros on those wheels, maybe minus a couple hundred if you sell the old wheels or something, now you have a bike that's 7.8 kilos, dropped you know almost half a kilo. Um, it's lighter than the SL8 model, the model that comes up above it. Um, and it might even feel lighter because there's more weight loss in the wheels, arguably. 
Uh, and now, like riding both of those bikes back to back, I mean, yeah, like the the CFR is obviously still lighter. It's not four times lighter though, and I'm just kind of like, man, like this SL7 with just a modest wheel upgrade is a really really good bike, and that still brings the price tag to like three grand. That thing is awesome. I love bikes like this. So that I, that, I used, that, that brings me back to sort of the way I would have bought and built bikes in the past. And I'd, I'd done that with both a Tarmac SL5, uh, being a Campag aficionado. The bike came with, I think, Ultegra 11 speed mechanical. And I bought it one year, it must be like 2016, 2015, 2016. Stripped all those components that came with it and put on Athena EPS. Uh, I'm just waiting for the shock to set on here. There it is. Yep, yep, they're shocked, yes. Uh, but that's what I did <laughs> uh, with Shamal wheels. Um, had to sell that bike to to pay for a wedding. Um, anyway, moving swiftly on. Uh, I did the same a couple of years later with a giant tough road. Um, that uh, was a, I was trying to get into gravel. And that bike, I think, came with Sora and giant sort of weird stem faceplate that converted the mechanic or the mechanical levers into hydraulics um which i didn't use it for very long it worked fine for the short period that i used it um but then i upgraded all that and scouring ebay managed to find ultigra di2 with the original non-series hydraulic di2 levers from shimano and a set of Shimano RX 81 rims, I think, if I've got the name right. So there's like, you can, effectively what I did in both cases was got the bike that I wanted for much less than if I was to go out and buy. Uh, well, the, the problem is the Tarmac, there was no camp bike option. And the Tough Road, there was no DI2 option. And if those are the things you want, then this is the way to do it. But you actually might save a penny in the process. Yeah. Like I said, I've got that Trek ALR5, the new one, the new, new one, which isn't even on their website yet, which is very confusing. Uh, there's like, it was like a press release and they sent me a bike, but it's not on the website. Weird. Soft launch, I guess you, call, you would call it. Uh, but that bike is sweet, like less than three grand. I actually don't have an exact price in front of me. It's, I was just looking it up. It looks like it's 2,300 pounds. So at the moment, that'd be about 2,800 US, uh, 105 mechanical, like just phenomenal bike calm tail shaping feels fast it's great i'm just i'm totally into these types of i mean maybe that's what i'll run at the iron horse actually maybe i'll ride that bike that would be fun uh, i think you should we don't have i think no you should run whatsoever. <laughs> <laughs> i think you should run that bike with 23s on it so it did the one weird spec thing is it came with 28s or sorry, 25s. Um, but it's on it's on those Bontrager Paradigm rims, which I don't know the internal width of. I but appears I think the, they're 17s. The the, the, the I think it must be maybe it's a new one because it looks. I haven't measured any of this stuff. It literally just showed up. It looks like the rim is legitimately like wider than the tire is. It's a very strange. It's like makes this weird cone. Oh, interesting. It, it's weird. Uh, and and to be, to be perfectly honest, like in a year in which. Uh, Milan San Remo was very nearly one on a 30 millimeter tire. No, no amateurs bicycle should be showing up with less than a 28. Like that's kind of how I feel that they were probably specced like a while ago and things are moving very fast in this area, but that's generally how I feel about tires at the moment. Like a 25 is even if it it, it did blow up a little bit, I, I bet if I measured it, it's probably like 27. It's still a weird um, choice. I'm pretty sure when that Amanda does pop up on the Trek website, It'll mention that it's max tire clearance of 28 millimeters, believe it or not. So um, that might be why it comes to 25s. That That, is, that is probably using Trek's kind of famously yes. conservative yes. measurement. So they, mm. they allow for clearance of six millimeters all around at minimum. Um, so yeah. 28 millimeters with six millimeters of clearance. You could, like, if you ran a 30, then that would give you five mils of clearance. I mean, just again, just eyeballing it, uh, you could fit a thirty or a thirty-two in there. I, you can probably get like a, you could probably get like a twenty-nine by two six in there. You're fine. Yeah, <laughs> good to go. Should we wrap this thing up? We I should wrap like this thing up. Long I, enough. We it yeah, yeah. We, it is long enough. I I do have a PSA, but I'm I'm going to reserve that for another episode because yeah, like All you right. mentioned, Kaylee, we we should be done for the day. Done. Anyway, I guess. 
Thanks, as always, for listening. As we have mentioned a couple times here before, if you have not already become a member of Escape Collective, please go ahead and head over to the website to do so. That's escapecollective.cc. Uh, you may or may not have noticed that we have no ads on this podcast, and that's not to say that we will never have ads on any of the Escape Collective podcasts, but we are never going to have ads on this one. So if you want to hear more Geek Warning and you like the show, please consider becoming a member because it is how we pay for all this stuff. I, I might actually do an ad for this show. I might oh. advertise my Google Meet bike fits. Anybody <laughs> wants to join <laughs> and critique. <laughs> wait, wait, do we get to fit you? Or are you feeding, fitting us? Uh, I, I, I realized midway through that that it sounded like I was advertising a bike fitting service. I'm, I was more advertising uh, bike fitting services could come onto my Google Meet and well, I, critique I think, my position. I, I was going to say, I think there's more financial opportunity in Ronan giving people the opportunity to tell him what sort of changes he has to make. <laughs> like, Ronan, put your saddle up 40 yeah. millimeters. Mm. <laughs> Given how low I run my saddle, I'm guaranteed I'll get that uh, <laughs> suggestion quite a bit. Uh, I wouldn't pay for that. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> we could, we could. I, I was going to say we could offer bike fits in that way, but that's a terrible idea. We should not do that. We do not have the expertise to be we'll, to be offering internet bike fits. To we people. will. We'll figure out something else. I'm sure. Cats. Yep. Definitely cats. Either way. Cats. Anyway. That'll, cats. that'll be it for us this week <laughs> I'm going to cut things cut things off here before Kaylee goes off and get another tangent thanks again for listening yeah. we will see you all next week 